Hello, my name is George Brissaker, uh, and this video is part of a series of presentations on formal ontology and semantic data. This particular video uh, will be looking at uh, setting up a CDOC CRM adoption and use strategy. So, CDOC CRM uh, and formal ontologies uh, are trying to build uh, a uh, picture and actually a new way of dealing with data in which uh, specialists like curators, conservators, uh, and excavators, we're talking about cultural heritage, document data about different subjects using different tools in different schemas. So this would be some evidence layer down here, uh, which they're able to aggregate up into a common semantic structure, a com common representation of data outside of these individual schemas that link together information from excavation records, from conservation records, from uh, curatorial uh, research, and bring it together into one common structure, which is accessible uh, by the broader public and by other researchers, which can make reference to that data uh, and uh, put that information into publications, into now defunct CD-ROMs, uh, and uh, reference it in, in articles and what have you. Uh, and then share new information back into, the, uh, into this uh, general schema, which is again referenced back to primary information, so that if new data, for example, was discovered by a conservator about the dating of some, uh, some object that was found in a site, that that information could be brought back uh, to or, 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 or shared to the archaeologist, who might then do some new uh, process on the site to try to understand it better. So the idea is a, a, a web, a, a, a network of knowledge, uh, where we move out of individual data silos, share that information to, into a common semantic network, and then are able to uh, share research and move uh, common research uh, projects together faster, more efficiently, uh, and uh, in a more interesting way. So, to do that obviously isn't easy, uh, and that can be a stumbling block uh, in the adoption of CDOC CRM or any ontology is that people get interested in the idea of creating semantic networks uh, and they start working on how to map information from their data into an ontology, uh, but then uh, the project stumbles or spends a lot of time on this intellectual project and doesn't spend enough time thinking about the overall investment uh, you'd have to do in order to uh, do a full-on semantic mapping that was sustainable and that would become a real part of your research. So the topic of this uh, presentation is to look at a high level what you need to do to make that a reality. So this diagram here uh, is uh, giving a schematic of uh, the components of running a semantic project. So what are those components? Well, we have at the bottom of the schema uh, source material or the actual world. So data is always about the world, whether it be a document or a physical object, uh, and that's always a grounding, an epistemic grounding uh, for the work that we do later on. The real world is represented in different data sources. The different data sources uh, are always going to be heterogeneous, uh, and uh, there's no way we're going to escape that. So we just have to know that there is data source A, B, and C. That thing should be registered in some sort of database uh, for sources where you say, these are the resources, these, this is the material that I want to work from, uh, and it's made in this tool and it uses that schema, it's made in another tool which uses that schema, uh, so that you can begin to plan out the things that you want to integrate into a semantic uh, web of knowledge. So what you need uh, before you start doing all of your mappings uh, and that sort of thing is to uh, identify your sources and have some sort of data structure, whether it be a database or just an Excel or whatever, where you're going to document the things, the kinds of data that you want to bring together. Then, uh, very practically, you'll need a semantic mapping tool. So that's a tool that will help you do a translation from your data source to an ontology. There are many different options there. Uh, that mapping uh, should feed a transformation tool, which actually uh, takes those instructions that you've devised for transferring your information from one schema to another 
and takes the data within this, the one schema and transfers it into the other schema. Uh, when we're talking about ontologies, then what you've transferred your data into will be some uh, triple format. So we talk about the kind of database there is a triple store, so you need to select a triple store where all of these uh, different data sources that you've registered here and mapped here, uh, their data finally gets retranslated into a common format over here. And then you want some sort of, that would just be a database. So like any database without something on top, uh, it's difficult to work with unless you're a computer scientist. So you'd want to put some sort of visual querying and representation platform on top of that database uh, so that you could work with it as a researcher who's interested in the data and not in writing queries. And that platform would pr provide visualization tools, querying, reporting, that sort of thing. This is the overall picture and infrastructure you need to put together if you're serious about doing uh, a sustainable, long-term uh, semantic project, CRM, CDOC CRM or otherwise. Uh, so in order to make that happen, uh, we could talk about four different stages, iterative stages that you'd want to put into place uh, to plan your semantic project. We can talk about planning, the planning step, the mapping step, a deployment step and a use step, each of which might require recursion back onto the previous step uh, in order to uh, move forward. And the whole thing uh, probably feeds itself iteratively, so you start with the planning of some initial things you want to map, you do a mapping and you deploy your information in a platform, you have your users test it, uh, and then that will inform if your mappings were good or if you want to go back, if you want to add new information, take some information out. So that's the circle uh, that you want to set up as a process in order to support your semantic uh, project. And uh, let's get into the details of that. So, uh, for planning, um, what you want to do is first of all identify the need for doing a semantic project. Second of all, identify the sources uh, that you want to bring into uh, a semantic network. Third of all, uh, start doing some conceptual modeling, uh, which we'll talk about more, and then identify the actual tools that you want to use. So digging into that, what do we mean by need? Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that you need to do to use a formal ontology or to make semantic data. Uh, so first of all, you should identify why, uh, why you want to do a semantic project and if you really need to do it. And there could be more uh, arguments than this, but basically, uh, if you have the need or the desire for common research or presentation uh, of information, and it's the case uh, that your data is heterogeneous, and it's the case uh, that there's no possibility of using one system and one data standard because you're interdisciplinary, you're different teams, you're different institutions, whatever it may be, then you would need semantics. If you don't have that need, you might avoid some complexity. <laughs> uh, so if you've established that you have a need for doing uh, semantic data, then the next thing you want to do is understand which data you want to represent uh, uh, semantically. So this is going back to the idea of sources. So you should create a list of your sources you should classify them uh, in terms of what encoding they use uh, and what they tell you about the world. Um, if it's going to be a long-term uh, project, then you might want to indicate who maintains those resources. So if you're doing a research project that involves archival information uh, from Institution X, then you might want to document Institution X looks after this and have some contact information because they might update their information and you might need to be aware of that uh, change in source data. So that's uh, identifying who to talk to uh, and to understand the information you want to map. Uh, then you want to start doing an initial semantic study of the sources. So what do these sources talk about and document that. Uh, and once you've done that, then you can start to choose the ontology you want to use. So in our case, we're talking about a CDOC CRM ontology or a CDOC CRM semantic project. CDOC CRM is used for cultural heritage and e-sciences, history more broadly. But if you fell outside of that, you might have sources about biology. You'd want to find a target ontology that was appropriate for biology, for example. Then you should learn the ontology. It's 
very basic. You can't go forward uh, without doing that. So, once you've listed your, you've decided you want to go semantic, you need to go semantic. You've listed your sources, you've understood what's in them, and you've learned, at least at a basic uh, level, the target ontology you want to use. Then you should begin a modeling step, uh, a mapping step. And so this uh, is a process of looking at the data that you want to integrate and trying to use the ontology to re-express it and making sure that you have the classes and properties in the uh, target ontology that will express the data that you've chosen to put into a common form. Uh, at this stage, uh, you're looking for potential gap gaps in the ontology. No ontology is com no formal ontology is complete and doesn't try to be complete. So, it's trying to give you the basic building blocks for building a well-structured uh, information uh, information chain for the domain that you're looking at. But you might have more specific concepts than are available in that ontology. In which case you want to identify where the gaps are that are in the ontology that you've chosen, and you can extend the ontology creating new classes and relations. Uh, that's a sort of uh, step that you need to take before you get into deeper into doing mapping because you need all of your uh, classes and properties ready before you do actual data transformation. So once you've done that, um, then you're going to want to identify the actual uh, software tools uh, you're going to use uh, in your project. So you're going to need to use uh, a mapping tool, which will allow you to write the instructions for transforming your data from the source to the target. You're going to want to choose a triple store or a graph database for storing uh, the semantic data. You'll probably also want this graphic environment that I referred to that will sit on top of the triple store database and make it comprehensible to a normal user, have a query. Uh, the data without having to learn SparkQL or some relatively complicated query language. And these things will be affected very practically, uh, not just by what you want, but by how much money you have uh, and uh, the available expertise in your community uh, for the kinds of platforms that you want to adopt. Uh, so it's very pragmatic. Um, so just to give some samplings of uh, tools uh, that one can consider. So you would want to cover these different aspects of uh, the project planning that I talked about. So you would want a source uh, register, uh, and so uh, that could be a simple Excel, it could be a relational database, it could be something fancier. Uh, within the Parthenos project, uh, a schema was devised for tracking uh, the resources uh, in semantic integration. So you might want to adopt a common schema like the Parthenos entities model. Then you need a mapping tool, uh, well-known and uh, documented mapping tools include the Mapping Memory Manager or 3M and Karma, uh, another tool. Then for triple stores we have a wide selection of commercial and open source software including OrientDB, Neo4j, Graph Database, uh, BlazeGraph, Ontotext, and on and on it goes. Uh, and uh, some, some semantic data management platforms, that is, ways to curate this data once it's in a triple form uh, and display it and query it. Uh, some well-known uh, platforms uh, for CDOC CRM include the Whiskey Project uh, and Research Space. So, so much for planning. Uh, once you've set up all of that planning, you're going to want to get into what is most people's initial step, which is trying to do mapping. So in terms of mapping, I'd like to point to breaking uh, that project down into doing maps, testing the maps. Uh, that'll be iterative several times before you get a useful, good mapping. Once you've done uh, a schema matching between your uh, source and your target, then you need to do data normalization on the values level. We'll look at that. And if you're bringing multiple sources together, uh, and especially if different people are doing mappings, then uh, because an ontology is a pidgin language, you can express the same concept using different classes, classes and relations. So you have to do a harmonization between different mappings to make sure that everybody is translating the same way. Um, that uh, can be represented uh, kind of using this uh, time or this uh, progress diagram here. So. You select your data sets that you want to map, uh, then 
uh, a domain specialist uh, learns the ontology uh, that you want to map to. You use a tool like 3M uh, to create the mappings. Uh, then you have a data engineer. So here we imagine uh, that a domain specialist, so an archaeologist, a historian, uh, a, a, a literary specialist uh, can do a mapping of their source data into the ontology if they've learned the ontology and they understand their own data. Then a data engineer creates URIs, which is the unique identifiers for different uh, data objects uh, in, the, uh, in the triple store, uh, and the data is transformed into a triple store, and we explore uh, the harmonized data. That's the overall path. Um, so, mapping, we would say, should be carried out by the domain expert, so your historian, your literary specialist, or what have you. Those, that person does the mapping uh, because they're the ones who understand their data, and semantics is about uh, expressing uh, the meaning of your data. So the only person who knows the meaning of their data is not a computer scientist, it's the person who made the data. Um, mapping is also... Uh, affected by your research goal, uh, so you can take the same data structure and map it differently because you have a different research goal. Uh, so uh, it's good to um, document the fact that you have a research goal and relate it to the mapping. Uh, mapping should be saved somewhere uh, because uh, you might want to update a mapping for multiple reasons. It could be that your source schema changes, so you create your basic data in this Excel spreadsheet and you document it with these 10 columns and then you discover there's five other things that you want to uh, document. You add those things in, you want to be able to not have to redo all the work that you did for mapping. First time you want to load up a mapping that describes what you already described and just add stuff on. So you want to save a mapping because you could change your source, your target ontology might change, uh, and also because you want to share that knowledge with other people. Especially if you if you map a standard schema, like uh, if you were to if you were to map Dublin Core as it was used for uh, French literary texts uh, from 1700 to 18, 1800. Uh, this uh, is a limited target audience, but there are other people out there who care about that data and who would be interested in having a ready-made mapping uh, from that schema into. Uh, CDOC Sierra or whatever other schema. So that's intellectual work that should be saved and shared. Um, so then you create your mapping and uh, mappings are not just an intellectual pro project but they uh, result in data being transformed and transformed somehow. somehow. So you have to move beyond the step of mapping on a piece of paper and saying I think that this semantic model documents my information. You have to really do data, data transformations and then look at the data and see if it makes sense uh, on the other end. Uh, to you as a human, uh, and then it would make sense also uh, processed in the computer. So in this uh, relatively uh, small image here, we have an example of a visual way of representing uh, RDF data in a simple sort of textual way that you can read uh, and it's very difficult once you've transformed information into RDF as a human to just read it and enjoy it. Uh, so uh, there are tools like this example here called the RDF Visualizer, uh, which allow you to load up an RDF document and read it kind of as a text and make sure uh, that the information uh, really translates the way that you thought it was going to translate or see if there's any problem. So you really need to create a feedback loop between conceptually mapping things as a researcher, and I think it's that way, then running the transformation and seeing, does my data look right on the other end? And oftentimes go back to the mapping tool uh, to adjust your mapping and uh, see if it's uh, and correct it until such point as you really get the semantics that you're after. Then, uh, all of that uh, mapping process is matching one schema to another schema, but it's not talking about the data values. You also want to say, you want to establish that if you're talking about things that can be standardized, uh, that you standardize on the value level the information. So that's where you not only want to uh, match your schemas, but you want to do data normalization of actual values using well-known thesauri like 
the Getty Art and Architectural Thesaurus, or uh, the Library of Congress Subject Index, or GeoNames for uh, Places. Um, and then the last part of uh, the mapping step is that you're bringing together, uh, say, say your project involves three different uh, sources, one's in Excel, one's in, a, in, in an access database, and one's in a file maker, and uh, they were made by a librarian, an archivist, and a museologist. Uh, so they've come in, they've used a tool like this is a visualization of 3M, They've used 3M to make the mapping uh, from their various data sources using their knowledge of CDOC CRM and their own information into one format. Then you have to go through and compare your mappings and make sure that you've made the same sorts of intellectual choices. So if, uh, if I use the property P1 is identified by E41 appellation every time that I'm talking about names, I want to make sure that you've also adopted the same strategy. So that when we finally have all our information in the same bucket, the same triple store, uh, that we will retrieve back uh, the same data in the same place. Uh, so all of this is to put a point on semantics is not easy, uh, but the value we get out of it uh, is uh, very important uh, in the long run because you can really integrate data and share information across knowledge silos. Um, so then, uh, moving on to the other two steps. Uh, once you've got harmonized mappings ready, then you can uh, look at deploying a platform. So uh, you'll want to uh, set up your triple store, uh, load uh, the data from your mappings uh, into the triple store. At that point, um, you can uh, begin to run queries over that uh, and uh, Earlier on, in a step I mentioned for, or forgot to mention, uh, you might have mapped uh, uh, the kinds of questions as a researcher you want to answer with your data. Uh, so those again would be the goals of your mapping process. Uh, so we talked about that a bit in terms of uh, documenting your mapping and what the research goals are. So if you have documented queries of what you want to be able to answer with your data, once you've dumped it into the triple store, then you can get your, uh, your uh, computer scientist partner, or if you're proficient, uh, you yourself can write Sparkle queries to try and answer those questions with the combined data and see if the results are what you were waiting for. If something is not returning properly, you can return to the mapping and try to fix that. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we look at actual use. So the point of doing uh, semantic data isn't just to build a model, uh, and it's not to engage in uh, the process of mapping, uh, which is long and tedious, uh, but it's to actually generate data uh, which is useful to researchers, re useful to your project, useful to the public. So uh, it's important to actually have a test of your user adoption uh, so can they query the data, do they get back what they were looking for, so that here we're at the interface level where we've delivered a platform, uh, can they find the information they thought they would be able to find. So you should set up some sort of user feedback mechanism, again to be simple it sells, so are researchers satisfied, do they get the data back that they were looking for, uh, and set up a plan for um, enrichment uh, of your platform, whether it be in terms of uh, the tools allowing querying, or in terms of uh, if they don't find back the information they're looking for, is it because it's not intuitive how to look for it, or is it because it's not there, in which case you can go back to the planning uh, stage and identify new sources which would fill in gaps in your information pool uh, and create a richer, a richer network of knowledge uh, for the user. So, summing things up, uh, semantic data and CDOC CRM, why should we do that again? Uh, so, I've tried to put the point here that uh, doing a semantic data project is not easy, it requires institutional commitment, it requires planning, it requires uh, a long-term intellectual effort. Why would you engage in all of that? Well, uh, basic answers to that are you want to ask and answer questions across knowledge silos 
uh, in and across institutions and disciplines. So do things that you couldn't do in individual tools, but uh, look at a broader picture of the world which should only be available if you do some sort of semantic translation. Uh, semantic data is more explicit uh, and uh, is richer, uh, so you can ask and answer more complex questions uh, from your data structure. Um, the fact uh, of this is a hierarchy on ontologies and the fact you can describe things at a general or a specific level means that you can uh, create better knowledge discovery in a semantic data platform because you can uh, document things at a very precise level and yet enable a user to ask a very general question and return back that very precise information. Um, you can rediscover and reanalyze lost data, uh, so that's to say you can find, you can take uh, data that's sitting in uh, formats that are going uh, out of style uh, and translate them into CDOC CRM or another ontology and give them a new value uh, that they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and the fact of translating uh, uh, your data into a semantic structure is a part of the preservation of data because you then encode the very meaning of the data into the file that you save it in itself. Uh, so you give it a, a longer shelf life. Uh, and in terms of, those are all research reasons for adopting a semantic data uh, strategy. And in terms of information management, you can improve data awareness and interoperability. You can support sustainability and reliability of your data, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the format for exchanging data is uh, neutral, uh, so it uh, divorces you from the need for a particular software platform. Uh, so that's uh, what I wanted to talk about today uh, about uh, semantic uh, data strategies and implementing uh, CDOC CRM, and here's some reference information for uh, CDOC CRM and how to use it, um, a how to manage uh, research data using a, um, a semantic model and Parthenos entities could be found out on the Parthenos website. Uh, here's the reference to the two semantic platforms, Whiskey and Research Space, and uh, here's reference information to the uh, X3ML or 3N mapping tool uh, where you can try it either online uh, or download it and install it yourself.